But yeah, back to this notion of guiding principles, some of them have been like huge issues in the history of science. And I talked about space and time, but one of them is like objectivity. Right? This idea that you you ask the person on the street, what are the, what are the adjectives that describe science? And they're like, well, it has like a corner on truth, maybe. That science has like this corner on capital T truth. Um, and there are, there are some philosophers and scientists who continue to say things like this, but that's wildly problematic because that itself is a philosophical view. Like, how would you know, as one single person even, um, that that this is a special kind of truth? Now, it's true that we have em how true is empirical it? <laughs> <laughs> medium capital T. Like the slash is somewhere between like, okay, we have quasi -truth? different size T's to begin the word yeah, truth. I'm gonna okay. say like you know fifty fifty. I don't know, All like right. twenty proof. Well, that's weak. <laughs> that is weak sauce. Anyway. Um, Objectivity is also one of the things that's supposed to make the knowledge and the truth that comes out of science a bit more untouchable. Mm -hmm. um, but objectivity is where the development of quantum mechanics gets you in trouble. Because if you mean objectivity to be something like, when we do science, we can rope off this realm or this system, and we can poke it and prod it and study it and ask lots of questions, blow it with hot air, like see what comes out. Um, and that's how you do it. Like you have to assume that there's some divide between you, your apparatuses that are measuring the thing and the thing itself. This is a very old problem. I think it's even Aristotle's- It's a measurement that, problem. It is, and it's an old one, except in the sense that like Ar Aristotle, I think, or somebody said like, if you want to study a bird, you can watch it flying around in its habitat and singing and all that, but you also like need to dissect it and look at it, but you can't have them both really, because if you've dissected the bird, you've- He can't fly around anymore. Is, well, I, I thought that was you don't want that happening, right? <laughs> yeah, I thought that was Feynman had oh, a, whole, is it? a whole lecture on birds. Oh, then I, I really don't want to quote Feynman for okay. a lot of reasons. <laughs> but I like what you said, where if you really want to know what a bird is, you have to open it up, cut it open, and then it's not the bird that you were studying. Right. You just influenced the thing you were trying to understand. Right. So we know how to sort of quotient out that engagement in classical theories to a point that we can get very nice tr um, predictions of like football trajectories and uh, hence, hence the idea of an objective truth right um, but what happens in quantum mechanics is and Bohr and um, many others were realizing this already in a hundred years ago right in 1925 when it was first developed that there's 100 a hundred years ago we're in the centennial that's right <laughs> it is the hundredth anniversary of. Like, we we my did favorite. a whole live show at Beacon Theater yeah. yes, celebrating quantum the centennial. Physics. There's been a lot of, of celebrations. It's the International Year of Quantum. Yes. I'm just gonna have like I'm gonna have mm. to sleep for all of 2026. Just <laughs> but that's when wave mechanics was developed and new physics. Yeah, anyway. every year, and and Hubble discovers that we're we're not the only galaxy. Wow. 1826. There's always something um, to celebrate, right? 1926. Right. Mm -hmm. There's a way when you're talking about quantum systems. Uh, like photons and electrons and these things, that you cannot avoid interacting with a system in a way that cannot be quotiented out. Mm. Okay. And so this is something that Einstein continued to look for. Uh, in particular, he thought that when, you're, when a, a physical theory is complete, that means that you can give a mathematical state bijectively. That means there's a mathematical state that corresponds to some real system in the world. Did you just use the word bijectively? Yeah, sorry about it. That's a word? It just means in both directions, okay. like that, that you can read from the math to the world or from the world to the math. Interesting. That's I all. Love it. That there's a I nice that correspondance. Word. Bijectively. Cool. And I think somewhere else Schrodinger says, yeah, Einstein, he likes a, a map with a little flag on it saying, here's this system and here's the system, mm -hmm. right? Um, and because in, in um, Schrodinger's wave mechanics, you can't do that anymore. Um, because once a system, two subsystems have interacted quantum mechanically, and we pull them apart. And even after interaction has ceased, Einstein says, you should, if you have a complete theory, you should be able to give a state, a description mathematically of this guy over here that doesn't make reference to this guy over here. Oh, that's- They're totally that's, separable. That's kind of a, an issue, right? It is. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It that's a little issue. bit of Because an issue. entanglement <laughs> right. can be it understood yeah, as non-separability. Right. In fact, there are, it means there after there's a quantum interaction and it's a new kind of thing that it's not mechanical, it's not thermal. Like 
Okay, so you don't a, even have to like. It's a new thing. It's a new thing, and it's not just a new thing. It is, according to Schrodinger, the thing that causes departure between classical theories and quantum theories. Mm. When systems interact, something weirdly different happens, and you can no longer talk about the system, the, the physics of one, without without considering the other or right. reference it. That's right. Because wow. That's wild. It is wild. I, 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 I love okay, it. Okay, yeah. but in all fairness to the objective truth people, they're really, I don't think they ever intended to include quantum systems in it. They're sure. talking about the macroscopic classical physical world, right? Well, can, but here, can, can you have both? I mean, can you just isolate the one for, for those circumstances and for, then yeah. have the question of the other? like philosophically and I'll say physically. Is that possible? It is, but even Einstein realized right away that quantum theory, if it's made if it's about the really small stuff, what is the big stuff made of? <laughs> well yes. The, a bunch of the really the small, small stuff. stuff. Right. So there's a way that Schrodinger's description mathematical description of the quantum stuff that means you can't separate out systems, that's part of it, should also apply at the macroscopic scale. So there becomes this whole issue of how do we explain, first of all, what this theory of small stuff is doing, mm -hmm. and then what happens when we get to this level, because at this level, it doesn't look like you and I are right. entangled or anything like that, right? Um, and we can give really good physics explanations now for why that's the case. Um, but a lot of people like mistakenly think that the Copenhagen... Copenhagen interpretation, like Bohr and the others, that were so in intent on recovering objectivity so we could talk about quantum science, um, made a sharp and fast distinction between the classical world and the quantum world. Like, you have your measuring apparatus, and that is a classically sized thing, so that we as humans— It's a blunt instrument. It's that, a blunt instrument. Yeah. That's right. Um, and then you have the quantum system that's, that it's interacting with. Mm. But, but in order for them to interact, they, we have to talk about them in the same theory. However— it, aren't you allowed to say macroscopic objects, all these wave equations average out and to get to this classical result? But we know better than, it's not just average, averaging out, it's a process called quantum decoherence. Decoherence, which is sure. Mm -hmm. What is entanglement, that, Yeah, entanglement itself, um, when you, t well, it's the same problem about objectivity, but first of all, I just want to clear the air, like Bohr never, uh, in in his post-World War II um, popular extras and stuff, he sometimes talks about a classical world. But he never, ever, there's no evidence that he believed there was some really separate realm. Like, it's a continuous situation. Thank you, Chuck. You're my friend. <laughs> You're here for me. It's a continuous situation. And he's like, okay, it's continuous, but we still have to, we are physicists, and we go into the lab, and we look at a, a machine with a pointer. We, we have to be able to talk about that. So there's this pragmatic aspect of what he's saying. Interesting. It's pragmatic objectivity. It is the failure of our being able to give this hard and fast divide between the object we're studying and the world around it that accounts for why we can't see things as quantum mechanical. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's because the things, the quantum systems we're looking at are in fact interacting with lots of other stuff. Einstein said God doesn't play dice with the universe, famously. Uh, is, is there, are philosophers landing in a place where there is objectivity in quantum physics? It depends. Oh, sorry, are, are they headed to a place? Is that yeah. a goal at all? Well, if you mean objectivity as intersubjective agreement, like that we could go into each other's labs and agree on the results of what each other see, then well, clearly, yes, that's a part of what okay, we Okay, of course, because otherwise there's no science without sure. that. Okay. But I mean, I was at the 100th anniversary of quantum, like Helgoland conference. Helgoland is the little island in the North Sea where Heisenberg went to do a wee bit of cocaine and to finish how to do... Uh, where do you get all the scoop on people? <laughs> And I'm going to tell I you something. I read their letters. <laughs> oh, the letter? Because <laughs> it's not in their books. Yeah. Right. Let me just that say is, this one is, thing, uh, make a sure. correction there. Uh, there is no such thing as a wee bit of cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do a quantum. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they got a bunch of physicists together. They had a panel session with a number, of, like four recent Nobel laureates in oh, physics. Cool. And they're talking about the Bell experiments, which test entanglement and show that they're not communicating faster than the speed of light or anything like that. And it's something we call non-locality, which I would characterize as like the like the signature that we can measure, the signature of entanglement. That's a poetic way of putting it. These physicists won the Nobel Prize for designing experiments to test this, and they could not agree on stage what non-locality meant about the world. Okay, so tell us what non-locality means. 
I'm not going to be able to supply an answer if two bell no lo lord. <laughs> I think I think it's it's just indica indicating that systems are in quantum interaction is a kind of interaction we have never studied before in okay, physics. Okay, so non-locality means these two particles that are entangled cannot be described independently That's right. of each other. So so this is not local. It is connected. So it's not just that, because we could do that classically, right? Um, if Chuck always wore different color socks, mm -hmm. and I saw just one of his socks on a given morning, it's like he's wearing a brown sock, I could know something without measuring his other sock, I would know that it would be non-brown. Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. That's purely classical, not interesting. What makes it very non uh, non classical is the idea that once these systems have for all purposes we believe stopped interacting they're not communicating there's no information going between them nothing is exchanged if we go if they while they're in flight we can ever at our over at our measuring device for this guy set it to measure some quantity or other spin with respect to some angle or something uh, and, measuring a quantum property of that that's right. entity. Yes. Yeah, mm. some property of that entity. Um, and the other one will know it, what what it is that was state, measured and what state the other thing so is. So therefore in. it's not local. So right. That is the non local So it's yeah. not just that there's a correlation between the two. We have lots gotcha. of classical correlations that we love. Um, but it's that these correlations cannot be explained. They the correlations exceed like just statistical randomness. Can you gotcha. one but day- But yet they can't be talking to each other. Can you one day- That's what, there you go. They can't be communicating That's unless you want to ditch the speed of light and gotcha. most people are happy to say, did well, you wait, like Chuck woke up this morning and said, I'm happy with the speed of light being what it is. Wait, at least why not go, go full Monty here and say the two particles are connected via wormhole? So there are, we could give alternate explanations, but wormholes are way, they would have other effects, wouldn't? Like you they think, would well, have other. It's, it's, a, it's a entanglement wormhole. I mean, who knows? With a wormhole, you're not moving faster than the speed of light. You're just cutting through yeah. the space-time continuum instantaneously. I think it would be hard because entanglement, non-locality is, is, is so ubiquitous. Um, mm. I think it would be, it's not impossible, of course, and this is where like mm -hmm. your guiding principles come in, but to just think that wormholes occur whenever they, but also entanglement is, can happen with respect to different properties of a thing, and it can change over time, and it can be multiple systems depending on those. So it is a really complicated relationship. Okay, so now I measure one of the particles, the other one manifests itself uh -huh. with the complementary properties, and now I've just de, -co they're no longer yeah. coherent. Uh, they're, yeah, they're no longer entangled after you've entangled. done that measurement. Okay, so yeah, just, yeah. now they're local particles. Yeah, and in fact, the measurement that you do, the physics that we're doing is all local over there, mm -hmm. right? right. Um, but yet there's this thing we can't explain. All right, so my question to you is, is it the physicist who's taken a little bit of philosophy mm -hmm. that'll help them address all of these questions? Or is it the philosopher who's taken a little bit of physics who might get us out of these conundrums? I think we could use all the help we can get. Yeah. <laughs> Let's all You're talk like, to one another. Who cares where it comes from? <laughs> <laughs> all hands on deck. All hands on deck. Right. I mean, so, so wait, wait, a, I'm sorry, because I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. still, you guys were moving very quick, and I'm the guy sitting here without any PhD of anything, okay? <laughs> so, his, <laughs> You don't have a PhD? Yeah. Wait, Somebody who give this man an honorary doctor. I know, yeah, who, who invited yeah. you? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, based on what you just said, because I'm running it back in my head, is it the actual measurement at the time of measurement that makes the entanglement? Or uh, if there is there ever a decoupling at all? Or are they measured and then tangled and then forever entangled? All of those things can be true. Depend like So we could, we've developed ways to do weak measurements, uh -huh. which sort of lightly tap the system. It's like in a way so you can gather some information, but not fully decouple it, um, but, and again, the degree matters. Like there are some limits on how entangled certain numbers of states can be Didn't with respect that. to some, like, Very so good. it's, this is why we can use entanglement as a resource and it's like to help us explore different, like topologies in, 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 in holography, which is, you know, ADS, uh, like Andy de Sitter space and how it relates to conformal field theories, which I don't really know about. And I want to figure out like a guy, 
But they're using entanglement as a way to probe unmeasurable stuff. Thank you.